Hello, I'm Dr. Lori Pierce, the 2020-2021 President of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for tuning in for this discussion on social determinants of health and their impact on cancer care. The purpose of this video is to educate and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatments of individual conditions. Guests on this video express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions. These discussions should not be construed as an ASCO physician or endorsement. For this series on the social determinants of health, we invite guests with a wide range of views and perspectives. Some of these conversations may be provocative and some even uncomfortable, but ASCO is committed to advancing equitable cancer care for all individuals, every patient, every day, everywhere. I dedicated this vision to my term as ASCO president, and these conversations bring many voices to the table, voices that we need to hear to move forward and find solutions. We hope you learn new ways of thinking about these issues, and we invite you to join us in working toward a world in which every person with cancer, no matter where they live or what resources they have, receives high quality, equitable cancer care. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to the seventh episode of the ASCO Social Determinants of Health series. I'm Dr. Shakina Elmore, and I'm an assistant professor of radiation oncology and urology at UNC Chapel Hill. With me is Dr. Rami Sedom, a medical oncology fellow at Johns Hopkins. We're happy to be joining you wherever you are in the world. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this series is part of an initiative proposed by ASCO president, Dr. Lori Pierce, focused on increasing oncologists' understanding of the social determinants of health its impact on patients, and modify risk factors for cancer. Inspired by Dr. Pierce's presidential theme of equity, every patient, every day, everywhere. In this episode, we will review highlights in social determinants of health topics from the recent ASCO annual meeting, provide context to the research, and discuss clinical implications. So I guess we should just get started. Um, we wanted to provide a little bit of context because while I know everyone who's been watching this podcast is an expert in the social determinants, um, some of us might need a refresher and that's okay too. Um, so the social determinants, as most of us know, are really those things at the interpersonal, community, social, structural, higher levels that pattern our health outcomes and access. Um, so it's education, it's healthcare, it's uh, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context and economic stability in one model from Healthy People 2030. Um, but what we'll be talking about in, in many ways, you know, is at the individual level. So the individual social risk factors that, you know, are, are lower than kind of the social determinants of health. Um, and then we'll also be talking a lot about race and racism. And so in terms of racism, the best definition that I have found is by Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She's a noted geographer. And that definition is that racism is the state sanctioned or otherwise extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And one of the benefits of the podcast format is that you can rewind, fix yourself on this slide and read the definition a few times, like I did when I first came upon it, to just see how straightforward, but how all encompassing it is. And so racism is really a structural determinant of health. It kind of sits above even some of these social determinants that we talk about. It patterns health inequities directly. It also has these interactions with all of the social determinants of health. And I think that that will become clear um, with the abstracts that we're talking about. Really, really powerful uh, definitions. And uh, with regards to care access, you know, almost 40 years ago, Pinchaski and Thomas published their five A's of access framework. And the five A's, as you can see here, represent affordability. So thinking about what is the cost to patients. And there's been a lot of work coming out over recent years showing that these costs are increasing for patients directly with time. Accessibility, what is the distance to location or a particular service for patients throughout the country? Availability, what is the access to specialists and specialty resources? Accommodation, flexible scheduling, and acceptability. 
And the reason why we bring up this framework is it's a context to discuss the first of the abstracts that we will discuss coming from Dr. Guerra and colleagues at the Penn Abramson Cancer Center. While published 40 years ago, these issues remain pertinent today. And we know that clinical trials do not operate in a vacuum, but instead mirror a lot of the problems within our current healthcare infrastructure. And that's what makes this work most impressive to me. I do encourage all to listen to the oral presentation from the ASCO annual meeting, abstract number 100 titled, Accrual of Black Participants to Cancer Clinical Trials Following a Five-Year Prospective Initiative of Community Outreach and Engagement. So what was the problem they were tackling? The team identified a major gap for full inclusion of minoritized patients in their cancer clinical trials network. And their goal, as highlighted by this abstract, was to increase the accrual of Black participants in cancer clinical trials. Importantly, they took a multi-level approach. But before thinking about any intervention, they went out into the local communities, they spoke to the patients, to the community leaders, pastors, community advocacy groups, and outreach groups to really listen to what the problems were. And by engaging with the, those most important stakeholders, did they really think about what were the most important interventions? And what did these interventions look like? Well, the team at the Penn Abramson Cancer Center focused on educational efforts in Black communities, dispelling many myths about cancer clinical trials. They also increased touch points and access points for patients to access care. Most importantly, these came through breast cancer and colon cancer screening for both insured and uninsured patients. One thing that really stuck out to me, very pragmatic and thoughtful in its design, was to make sure that culturally tailored marketing strategies were also available for patients to see. They worked with pharma to make sure that Black patients were also shown on pamphlets discussing cancer clinical trials. And when thinking about access to care, we know that transportation is oftentimes a barrier, especially for our most vulnerable patients. So they had made sure to have contracts and connections with Lyft and other ride-sharing agencies to make sure that people can make it to the cancer center. And from the healthcare infrastructure side, they established new requirements for minority accrual plans and made sure to use community health workers and one-on-one -on -one patient navigation. And what was the ultimate impact of their work? Over a five-year effort, they reached more than 10,000 individuals through various venues. And when looking at their primary outcome, they more than doubled the number of Black patients who were accrued on cancer treatment trials. And they saw up to a fourfold increase in the accrual of Black patients in non-interventional treatment trials. However, what is most important is they established a new level of trust with patients in communities that they were not before reaching. And they were able to remodel their organizational care delivery infrastructure to address this major gap in care delivery. So what was the hallmark of the strategy and how can we pragmatically implement it in our own institutions? First, they focused on understanding local needs. Importantly, they established bi-directional relationships and they made sure to acquire data to show the business case for why this is a return on investment for patients, their local city and their healthcare infrastructure. I want to applaud Dr. Guerra and her team for making sure that this was a long-term investment in the Philadelphia area. What first started as a research grant later grew to involve the entire cancer service line, all the way with the director of the cancer center and making, making sure to involve their entire organization. And what is the lesson learned? While Black participants are significantly underrepresented in clinical trials, but it is not because they are resistant to participating. Instead, this is likely due to structural, clinical, and organizational barriers. In our local communities, the underrepresented 
minoritized groups may look different. Perhaps they may be racial minorities, they may be rural dwellers, adolescents, or perhaps elderly patients, sexual gender minorities, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to open this up to Dr. Elmore and see if you have any other comments or thoughts from hearing about this. This is such tremendous work, and and I agree. I think that it's um, it, it's a testament to to so many things. I think that responsive development of interventions is so critical, um, and that truly, um, you know, black patients and Black people want to be included in the things that are meaningful to to changing our health outcomes. Um, and so I really, you know, there's so much here, and I and I really hope to see, you know, sort of more efforts like this, you know, in both trial enrollment and, you know, for standard of care enrollments. Absolutely. And, and uh, hats off for ASCO uh, advocacy for really uh, pushing forward the Clinical Treatment Act, which made sure to uh, ensure that clinical trial uh, costs were also covered. This was a landmark decision that came in December of this previous year. And also uh, policy implications from Medicaid expansion, which we know was also relevant to this local area. And we look forward to uh, seeing this implemented on a larger scale through partnerships with ASCO in future years. And with that, I'd like to transition to our next abstract that Dr. Elmore will lead us through. Great, thanks. Um, So this abstract, financial toxicity, symptom burden, illness perceptions, and communication confidence in cancer clinical trial participants. Um, The first author is Dr. Suba Perni, and the last author is Dr. Ryan Nip, both of which I know well from MGH. And so the problem here that they were trying to address and explore is that, you know, trial participants are at high risk for adverse effects from financial toxicity. But we don't really know that much about what the scope and type of those adverse events might be. So, you know, with this study, they prospectively enrolled trial participants um, from MGH for about two years. um, And they, you know, sort of saturated their sample with those that were already referred, you know, per their request for financial assistance. Um, And so they assessed financial toxicity in kind of these two ways, both asking uh, these participants about financial burden overall of care, and then focusing in on trial cost concerns. Um, And then they also asked, you know, using kind of standardized validated measures about patient reported outcomes. So physical and psychological symptoms, illness perception and communication confidence. You know, how confident are they in communicating with their care teams? The results are interesting. Um, 200 patients, so 57% in this group, you know, noted that they had financial burden overall and 41% uh, with trial cost concerns. Um, Those that noted financial burden um, were more likely to be young patients, which makes sense. Um, And trial cost concerns, you know, those were more frequent among patients with lower incomes. You know, both of these were were significant. And I think that that speaks to um, the validity of these constructs of financial toxicity. Um, And then, you know, this is the most interesting part. Financial toxicity was associated with greater physical and psychological symptom burden, negative illness perception, and lower communication confidence. So the bottom line here is that financial toxicity was associated with worse patient reported outcomes across all domains that were measured. Lots of future questions here. So how might financial toxicity operate in different clinical settings? You know, these are trial participants at a, you know, designated cancer center. How does that work in community oncology practices or among non-trial participants? How might financial toxicity moderate some of those other social risk factors or social determinants of health? You know, we know from other health outcomes that if you look at Black Americans and white Americans with a health outcomes disparity, that disparity sometimes widens as you climb socioeconomic strata. And then how might financial toxicity influence oncologic outcomes? You know, more physical symptom burden, more psychological symptom burden, worse communication, that could all lead to worse oncological outcomes. 
So lots of prog- programmatic implications here. I think prospective identification of financial toxicity risk, you know, those patients who are at risk for that, and then aligning that with social and economic interventions. Um, but this certainly aligns with the previous abstract that we discussed, you know, sort of another lens on, you know, why people might not participate in trials and just, you know, the financial burdens um, that care can bring to patients and the fact that it impacts, you know, the very care that they're getting. Yes, absolutely. Such great work by Dr. Perny and Dr. Nip uh, and their team. I think we're just scratching the surface, as you mentioned, with financial toxicity and its implications on patient care and and the caregiver experience as well. Um, So all in all, I think the concluding remarks we could probably make is that equity is a simple concept to grasp but very complicated to execute and measure for success. We do want to uh, thank our authors who did uh, put time and effort in their careers uh, to opening up our eyes and for Dr. Pierce for really making this uh, the highlight and the theme of uh, of her tenure as ASCO president. So for those listening in, thank you for joining us for this episode of the ASCO Social Determinants of Health series. To keep up with the latest episode, please press, please click subscribe. Let us know what you think about the series by leaving us a review or by emailing us at professionaldevelopment@asco.org. On behalf of Dr. Elmore and I, thank you for listening in. Thanks.